up. Move it, take it up. Move. Get it, light it up. Move. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Paulette Senior. I'm the president and CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation. Welcome to the Canadian Women's Foundation's Digital Town Hall. And thank you for joining us. We're so excited that you are joining us this afternoon. The work of the Canadian Women's Foundation and that of the programs we support take place on traditional First Nations, Métis and Inuit territories. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet and work on this land. And however, I think you'll all agree with me that we recognize that land acknowledgements are not enough. And instead, we need to be pursuing truth, reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship in an ongoing effort to make right with all our relations. For 30 years, and yes, we are 30 years old this year, the Canadian Women's Foundation has been Canada's foundation for gender equality. We support women, girls, and two-spirit trans and non-binary people to move out of violence, out of poverty, and into confidence and leadership. I'll now invite Andrea, Andrea Gunraj, who will uh, share some housekeeping items with you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Paulette. And I just wanted to draw to your attention that closed captioning is available. There's a link in the chat. You'll see there it's the stream text link. Please go ahead and click on that to get access to French closed captioning. And of course, make sure you stick around all the way to the end of the event. We're going to have amazing prize draws later on. For those of you who attended our February Digital Town Hall, that was February a billion years ago, thank you very much for your feedback. We'll address many of the topics that you shared with us that you wanted to uh, get more information on. This is a very packed event, so stay tuned. And make sure to fill out our feedback form after the event. You'll see on screen, there'll be a link to a uh, feedback form that you can sign up on and give us your information about what you'd like to see next time. We're recording this event to share online afterwards. Please take note of that. We can't see anybody's faces on the recording, so um, don't worry about that element. And along the way, I'll ask you to please type your comments in the chat box. We do have moderators to make sure we have respectful and safe conversations all along the way. And thank you for your patience in advance if we run long. There'll be a short question and answer period as well, starting around after five o'clock. If you'd like to participate, please type your questions in the chat and we'll be sharing that with our uh, presenters who are going to be answering the questions. We won't be able to answer every question, but we'll pick some really good ones to be able to share. And please note, we will not be checking the raised hands functions at the bottom of your screen. For every panelist, I'll ask that you please try to speak in a paced manner. We have interpreters and we have captioners and rushing along will not help. And just a content note for everybody, we are going to be addressing gender-based violence along the way. There'll be some difficult content in various points. Please take care of yourself along the way. Step away from the screen if you need to, come back when you're ready, and if you would like to find support services in your region, you can do that. I'm going to share on my screen. We have support services listed on our website on those English and French links. Please feel free to go to our website and check that out. All right, we're moving along. So I'm going to actually pass it on to a segment with my colleagues. Um, they'll give you insight and updates on the Canadian Women's Foundation's exciting Northern strategy. I'm going to be sharing my screen. Give me a few minutes. My name is Dama Outed and I am uh, based in Iqaluit Nunavut. I work for uh, the Canadian Women's Foundation in partnership with Makeway on the Northern Women and Girls Program. Hi everyone, I'm Anuradha Dugal. I'm the Vice 
president of community initiatives at Canadian Women's Foundation. I'm based in Montreal, and I'm very happy to be working with Delma on the Northern Strategy. So the, the Canadian Women's Foundation had been thinking about uh, putting together a Northern Strategy for, uh, for a long time because we knew that our um, existing structures weren't reaching the organizations um, as efficiently and as effectively as we wanted to. They also, because they were often a, a tie, it was a time bound thing. People had to get an application into us by a certain time. Um, it, it proved to be very inaccessible for many, many Northern organizations who need um, more flexibility. Um, and then the other thing we knew was that because we always had quite uh, strict criteria, either the organization or the program um, that was um, that they were proposing wasn't always a, a very good fit. So one of the things that we um, were thinking about when we developed this program and big shout out to Make Way for all of their um, expertise and the ways that they helped us guide and understand how this could happen better. Um, what was really important was reaching the organizations where they were at. Um, and that means both in terms of how they want to present the application, when they want to present it, the kind of program they support and how it fits into both community building needs, leadership needs, and the ways that um, work is emerging in the territories, which is obviously has to be different from the way it's happening in other parts of Canada. And I think that was a really important thing about why we need Delma in place in Iqaluit because of her incredible connections to the community and her ability to travel across that space. It's a pretty wide area. Um, that's a really important part of, of why a staff person there is such a, such a strength for us at this time. And that uh, was, um, it was reflected in the conversations that we've had with not only the advisory committee that we had created through this program, but also conversations um, with organizations in the North and across the North. Uh, they were very complimentary in how the organizations are open and flexible to changes being made uh, within the program and within the organizations as well in terms of uh, application process and having someone uh, in the north uh, has really helped uh, in moving forward with the program and the connections that we have made um, through having conversations with organizations in the communities as well. Some of the organizations that we have supported so far um, include the Arctic Rose Foundation on their Messy Book Club. Uh, they have uh, expanded, they started their um, programs uh, in 2016, I believe, and they have expanded to two other communities because of, of the support that we have given them through this program. And uh, they will be starting up again uh, this fall uh, from the grants that we had given this past spring and they will be expanding to two other communities in Nunavut. Uh, and that's a, it's a, an amazing program because they have so many people from the community that are involved in the program. Uh, they hire mentors that are high school students to mentor youth and children that are in um, elementary and grade school um, ages. And they also have elders and local artists come in, which is a really amazing opportunity for the whole uh, community to, to collaborate. We've also supported Ili of the Nunavut Literacy Council on uh, two of their programs, two other after school programs as well. Um, and their focus is around cultural re revitalization programs. So they also include uh, mentors from the community to deliver programs and help coordinate programs for youth, um, high school students as well. And um, another organization we have supported through this fund is the uh, Katungu Heritage Society. Uh, they have a really neat uh, sewing program where they sew Mother Hubbard parkas uh, each for 20, pe 20 
participants mm -hmm. uh, within the community and they will be expanding that because of the uh, funding that we had supported them they will be expanding that to another community this fall i had just found out that they did receive more funding to uh, do this in another community in the Atomu region which is amazing um, we've also supported the baker lake uh, uh, prenatal um, program and uh, they help mothers and parents um, with pre and postnatal <laughs> programs and they also provide food hampers for um, moms and parents in the community uh, that have just had their babies and support um, their parents in the community. Mm -hmm. And and one of the programs that we've also um, discussed before, Delma, that we uh, really appreciate the more the Northern Birth Work Collective, which works through mm -hmm. the um, the the territories and is based in in Yellowknife, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. So the Northern Birth Work Collective um, is an amazing organization that we have worked with. Uh, they just started in uh, fall 2020 and they want, they're actually a part of the MakeWay shared platform. And we've worked with them since the beginning and they they are doing such an amazing work and they have this great plan moving forward, uh, not only short-term, medium, but they also have long-term goals and also um, the possibility of expanding to the other Northern Territories as well. So it's really exciting news from them recently. Yeah, it's. I think those some of the things you've shared um, today about how this funding has either helped expand programming to more areas or has started an organization, helped an, an organization seed and fill a gap in the north around um, you know culturally specific and sensitive uh, doula and birthing practices, and to continue to um, you know really help the 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 space uh, that midwives need to take in in birthing um, scenarios I think is really one of the incredible strengths of this program and one of the reasons why we're so excited that it will continue into 2022 yeah. and beyond it's a, it's a long term yeah. project for us it's not just a one or two year program we know that this work has to be long term and we're really committed to to make that happen at the foundation with our partners. Thank you so much for that wonderful update, Anu and Delma. All right, so I'm going to be passing it over to my colleague who's going to give us a, an update on the spike in gender-based violence risks in the pandemic. But before we do that, I have another video I would love for you to watch. Vancouver's downtown east side is known for its creativity and community activism. But its residents also face disproportionate levels of poverty, violence, homelessness, and addiction. The downtown east side women's center offers safety, belonging, and empowerment to diverse women in this community. The center helps women with everyday needs, like meals, showers, and computer access, and also provides shelter counseling and other supports to achieve long-term stability. The COVID-19 pandemic intensified many problems, including gender-based violence, overdoses, mental health concerns, poverty, and isolation. Many women found themselves with nowhere to go and no way to access services that had moved online. Through the pandemic, the center has continued to support up to 600 women and children every day. But the need has only grown, with many more women seeking help. This increase in demand, along with physical distancing requirements, created an urgent need for more space and services. A safer and stronger grant enabled the center to open two new shelters, hire and train staff, expand their drop-in space, and provide direct services at a time when many other resources are unavailable. The Downtown Eastside Women's Centre is just one part of a network of community service providers working for gender justice in Canada. But they can't do it alone. Your help is essential. Donate now at canadianwomen.org. Hi 
everyone. My name is Keitha Mercer. I'm the Director of Community Initiatives and Grants at the Canadian Women's Foundation. Um, the video you just saw gave a little bit of an idea of the, of the impact of the Safer and Stronger Grants in Vancouver, BC. We've distributed these grants all over Canada to address gender-based violence in the pandemic, such as intimate partner violence and sexual violence. Starting in April 2020, the quick action of our partners and donors enabled us to grant several kinds of emergency funds to gender justice organizations in every region of Canada. One of these emergency grant streams is the one that you just saw a video for, the Safer and Stronger Grants, which was made possible by the Government of Canada uh, through the Women and Gender Equality Department. It helps gender-based violence organizations deal with the influx of service needs in, because of the pandemic. Um, in total, 518 organizations were funded through the Safer and Stronger Grants, and they have been helping meet the needs of survivors of violence and support their journeys to safety. Our grantee part partners have been sounding the alarm about the increased risk of violence. It's one of the gendered impacts of the pandemic, and re research has shown a number of red flags. In April 2020, right at the beginning, one of one in 10 women reported being very or extremely concerned about the possibility of violence at home. By June 2020, calls to police services related to domestic disturbances had increased by 12% since the beginning of the pandemic. By October 2020, shelters and transition homes had experienced a 61% increase in calls. And by March 2021, research showed that 160 women and girls killed by violence were killed by violence in 2020. More data is needed, but this rise from 2019 is a massive red flag. Gender-based violence is the type of violence that women, girls, trans, two-spirit, and non-binary peoples are at the highest risk of experiencing, especially those who are marginalized, including Indigenous women, women with disabilities, and women who are homeless or underhoused. Now there is a concern that this violence will only worsen in the, in the coming months and that the reverberations will be felt for years. Gender justice organizations like the one we fund will need your generosity to be able to meet this increased need in communities they serve. What have the Safer, safer, and, Stronger grantees, or safer and Stronger Grants done for our organizations throughout the country? Well, you saw the video in Vancouver and here's another one in Shediac, New Brunswick. Beau Séjour Family Crisis Resource Centre offers an array of services for women facing gender-based violence across southeast New Brunswick. Located in Shediac, they work with many survivors, including Francophone women living in rural areas, women with complex mental health or addiction concerns, and women with accessibility needs. One of the services they provide is short-term housing for women and their children who are leaving violent situations. When the pandemic hit, many in this community lost their jobs. Some women living with violent partners became more isolated at home. And some expressed greater concerns about firearms in the home. No access to public transit made it hard to get away. The need for the center's services spiked with 2,100 people seeking their help. Emergency shelter beds were full. Staff struggled to keep up with the need for housing support, and the pandemic created other challenges, like the need for frequent cleaning, using personal protective equipment, and virtual meetings. With the help of a Safer and Stronger Emergency Grant, the Centre can now offer another year of housing to help survivors of violence continue their journey to safety, provide more help for women escaping violence, better support their frontline workers who are at higher risk of virus exposure, help more women through their housing program, better manage the needs of people reaching out for support with the right digital tools. The Beau Séjour Family Crisis Resource Centre is just one part of a network of community service providers working for gender justice in Canada, but they can't do it alone. Your help is essential. Donate now at canadianwomen.org. Now I'm gonna chat a little bit with Lorelai Williams of Butterflies and Spirit in Vancouver, BC, who will tell us a little bit more about um, the work that they've been doing. 
So thanks for taking the time to join us today, Lorelai. Hi, uh, Lorelai Williams. I am from Shkati Nations on my mom's side and Sa'elis on my dad's side. I am calling in from the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And yeah, I do a lot of work around the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls uh, because I have a missing aunt. My cousin was murdered by serial killer Robert Picton. My other aunt was pushed out of a window in the downtown east side. My other cousin was taken by a different serial killer, Terry Arnold, when she was 16 years old and she was raped by him in the mountains. Thankfully, she got away. She's still alive today. But so I do a lot of work around this issue. And I used to work at the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Center. And I stopped uh, working there for to go back to school, but my work followed me. So after I left there, I was still doing work around the clock, um, working with women in violent situations, working with uh, families of MMIWG, working with the police and the community. So I was doing that on a volunteer basis. Just I, I can't say no when people reach out to me and they're in a crisis mode, I help because I have all the resources. And so with the Safer and Stronger grant, I was actually, I was able to get paid for that work. And I was able to hire an assistant uh, because I, I also run a dance group called Butterflies in Spirit. And we are a dance group of family members of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. We represent our missing and murdered loved ones on our t-shirts. So with my old job and my dance group, I was able to run both. Um, and we've done a lot of work throughout the pandemic. You know, the, the rates of violence definitely went up. And I think one, well, I know one of the reasons was because the border shut down. And, you know, with the drugs not being able to come into Canada, I think, what they turned to was uh, human trafficking um, and others. Like the violence went way up with them and women were being attacked more in their vehicles as well. So with that, we were, there was a lot of crisis support that I was doing before I got the grant. And I just continued the work after the grant with an assistant and even now with my assistant, there's still so much work that we're doing. So yeah, with the grant, we were able to support all these women in crisis situations, um, create videos. I've been able to work with my dance group as well. We've been able to um, support families of MMIWG. You know, during the crisis, our women are still going missing and being murdered at a high rate. And during the pandemic, you know, even though uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, the family still needs support searching for their loved ones. And I think the most uh, common or the most popular, hmm, I hate being popular, but the most well-known case right now here in Vancouver is the missing person, Chelsea Foreman. We were able to support her. I'm just gonna use her as an example because we've been able to support, we've been supporting the family for over a year. Uh, even before the grant came. But, you know, through the pandemic, you know, we're going in the downtown east side, we're helping the family search for their missing and murdered loved ones. We've had to mask up with N95 masks and go into the downtown east side. So even though it was a danger to us, it was either the pandemic or help the families of MMIWG. And because this is a huge issue, it's just like, I have to help them, right? So. They're not the only family that we've helped, but this is just an example. So, you know, these things are still happening during the pandemic and everybody needs as much support as they can get. You know, with the dance group, we're raising awareness of femicides, MMIWG, violence against women throughout Turtle Island. We, be, we've come, we became connected to uh, a lot of Latin American countries. So we've worked on videos with them as well. There's a lot of MMIWG and femicide rates down there as well. So along our journey, we, you know, we've 
we've uh, this is way before the grant you know we we performed in Colombia we performed in Mexico so we have those connections so we're coming together and raising awareness of the issues down there as well we've met families along the way from these um, from Latin American communities from the states learning a lot more about their MMIWG as well so uh, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but yeah. That's fantastic. Thank, uh, thank you so much for coming and joining Laura Lee. Like the work that you do on the ground is so critical. Um, and, you know, we're happy to, su to support, but the, the more important thing is that you're, you're able to be supported while you support people in, in community. Thank you for all the work you do and for coming to share with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the grant. Thank you for inviting me to speak here. So the question that we often get is, um, where do we go from here to end gender-based violence? Um, we focus a lot of attention on survivors, but ending this widespread violence to build safety and acceptance means transforming our culture of stigma into a culture of support. Um, stigma silences, shuts down, and keeps rates of gender-based violence at epidemic levels, and that is unacceptable. We all need to take action. So starting this fall, we're going to be, we're going to address uh, what we can all do to better support survivors in their lives and help grow a stigma-free, judgment-free Canada where no one has to feel intimidated or shut down when they say, I need support. Based on the violence at home signal for help launched last year, which is a hand signal that can be used to silently indicate you need help. We're going to share tools and resources and open conversations to make sure people, make sure everyone is equipped to have supportive stigma-free conversations. So stay tuned this November and thank you for being tireless for gender justice and safety in this pandemic. So before I pass it over to my colleagues, I will share one more video um, from the Safer and Stronger Grants. The Calgary Immigrant Women's Association supports women and their families who are new to Canada and experiencing immigration challenges, family conflict, abuse, and trauma. They offer services like counseling, support groups, emergency housing, and referrals to other services. Gender-based violence, such as intimate partner abuse, happens everywhere. But some women and gender-diverse people are at greater risk. Economic and language barriers, discrimination, and a lack of access to services that meet their unique needs all contribute to increased vulnerability. Because their clients have come to Calgary from all over the world, association counselors work in many languages, including Arabic, French, Hindi, Mandarin, Punjabi, Spanish, and Tigrinya. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, many community organizations have seen a 20 to 30% increase in calls related to gender-based violence, but calls to the Calgary Immigrant Women's Association rose by 50%. Many more women in this community needed support and counselors spent much more time helping them deal with job loss, isolation, and family stress and tension. A safer and stronger emergency grant help the association to increase their people power to meet the spike in women's needs, offer more counseling and support services, shorten the waiting list for their services. The Calgary Immigrant Women's Association provides life-saving support to women facing violence. It's a part of a network of community service providers working for gender justice in Canada. But they can't do it alone. Your help is essential. Donate now at canadianwomen.org. Thank you so much to Keith and Lorelai for that presentation. And I hope you're learning a lot about our programs this evening. So I'm now going to share how our tireless support has made such a profound impact in moving Canada closer to gender equity and justice. Then uh, I'm gonna ask Anu, Anuradha Dugal, uh, one of our VPs here that you heard from earlier to uh, join me in doing a Q&A about this. Uh, so there is a time coming up for questions. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to drop your questions in the Q&A box below and uh, then we'll be able to uh, uh, answer your questions directly. 
So uh, moving forward, um, 2021 marks the 30th anniversary of the launch of the Canadian Women's Foundation. I mentioned that earlier. And uh, the, our foundation was launched by incredible trailblazing women with the vision of a gender equal Canada. They began the journey. Today, you, you push their efforts forward through your support. The foundation is a national leader in the movement for gender equality, and we support women, girls, and gender diverse people to move out of violence, out of poverty, and into confidence and leadership. Since 1991, so 30 years ago, our generous donors and supporters have contributed over $130 million to fund over 2,500 life transforming programs throughout the country. So thank you, a big thank you to our founders, donors, board members, employees, partners, corporate partners, uh, colleagues and collaborators and friends. Uh, you have enabled this incredible impact in every province and territory for 30 years. So our world, as we've known it, has changed radically over the past year and a half. None of us have uh, remained untouched by gender injustice and the issues connected to it. Climate emergencies, systemic racism, poverty, colonization, health disparities, and a lack of access to social supports. There is no turning back from here. People like you clamor for community care and systemic change. But 30 years of gender equality gains are at stake today. Inequities continue to undercut human dignity and quality of life. So in the chat box, I ask again that you uh, share the gender equity issues that you are concerned about, that you're most concerned about in your community right now, today. Where we go from here is actually up to us. And I ask, are we up to the challenge? When we work together, we are up to the challenge. You have proven it with your generosity and passion over the last year and a half. Uh, what change have you been making at this critical time? Let me outline three of them for you this evening. Your impact has been amazing. 818 programs funded, including 128 serving First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities, and 165 serving rural, remote, and northern communities. Over 1,143,700 uh, lives impacted, including direct program participants, indirect people that are, have been impacted, and people impacted by the organizations who receive funding. 5,794,454 dollars contributed by almost 4,000 donors, individual donors, foundation, and corporate uh, donors, and 5,462 advocacy letters sent to decision makers by people just like you. In this slide, you'll see where our grant making goes. It's enabled programs to run at grassroots levels in every province and territory. So another big thank you for enabling this incredible scope of impact. So now I'm gonna uh, move forward to um, the way that the, we've been working throughout this pandemic in terms of thinking about the kind of recovery we need to be pushing for. When the pandemic hit Canada in March, 2020, you can all sort of remember that. It's disproportionately impacted uh, marginalized women and communities. Was, it was very clear that this happened immediately. Grantee programs of the, women's, uh, of the Canadian Women's Foundation were overwhelmed by the influx of community needs. Their services were more vital than ever, but they struggled to keep operations going and their doors open. Our supporters dug deep for the Tireless Together Fund in April 2020. In a matter of months, you generously donated over $600,000 to help gender equality programs continue to help women, girls, and gender diverse people move out of violence, 
out of poverty and into confidence and leadership. And with the partnership of the government of Canada, emergency grants were distributed all over the country to ensure local service providers could deal with the influx of need and continue to support women, girls, and gender diverse people to move out of violence and poverty and into confidence and leadership uh, during the pandemic. And between April 2020 and August 2021, we distributed over 1,000 emergency response grants totaling $107 million to gender justice programs and organizations. I, I get goosebumps when I think about what we've been able to accomplish throughout this pandemic. So you are indeed fueling change by enabling grant making to gender equity efforts all over Canada. Our grant making focuses on three important gender issues, ending gender-based violence, uh, promoting economic development for women and gender diverse people and girls empowerment. Our fourth area, which is inclusive leadership development incorporated in, is, is incorporated into all granting areas. You heard about this earlier. Our Northern strategy is a unique approach to funding for Northern Canada that cuts across all these important gender issues. And so this is why we're encouraging you to let's all dig a bit deeper. Our out of violence programs prevent and intervene in situations of gender-based violence. They pro provide services such as emergency shelter housing support, crisis support, child witness uh, to violence programs, and healthy relationship uh, education for teens. They do complex work to break the cycle of violence in families and in communities. Here are two programs that we're spotlighting, just so you could see uh, the types of programs that we're supporting in communities. Moving on to out of poverty programs. Uh, they reduce gendered poverty and build economic strength for those who need it most. They provide wraparound support to help participants break through barriers to access programs in the first place. They help participants break into well-paying fields where women are traditionally underrepresented, like in construction and trades and technology. Uh, they teach entrepreneurship and they help women. They help help women. Or I've lost, I've lost my spot a little bit. And they help women learn employment skills and gain work experience in social purpose business op businesses operated by community-based nonprofit organizations. I hope you're still with me. And through our investment readiness funding program, uh, made possible by the government of Canada's social innovation, social finance strategy, which has been absolutely innovative. Women-led, women-serving organizations have been given funding and tools to join the social innovation and social finance ecosystem in Canada. It is proving uh, to, uh, important for the sustainability of gender equality uh, organizations. And we look forward to being able to continue this in the future. And here's another program that we're spotlighting. Women Exploring Business Program in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which supports Indigenous and newcomer women overcome hurdles uh, to self-employment. And Candace, who's a program participant, says the following. When I started the program, I needed guidance and mentorship from people who had business experience. By the time it finished, I came out with a better understanding of how to manage money and where to start with running a business. Thanks to the program, program laptop lending program, I also came out with a working computer. As an Indigenous mother, I'm passionate about making Canada a better place for my son, my family, my community, and future generations. I want to set an example to inspire them to build on their own successes. Into confidence girls programs. Girl give they these programs give girls and gender diverse youth tools to develop into confident, resilient people, right when they need this support the most. 
It builds participant skills, provides them with mentorship opportunities, and it deepens their self-esteem in safe spaces just for them. Girls Fund programs offer STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, math education, sports, and physical activity, media literacy, uh, indigenous culture and connection, and mentorship. Here's another program that we're spotlighting. Uh, the Girl Power Girl Force uh, program in Calgary, Alberta, creates spaces for girls to build a sense of community, explore issues in their lives, and build their sense of activism and leadership. A girl in the program said this, everyone was really accepting and respectful. I also felt that everyone was open and expressed their personalities, which made me want to do the same. And in terms of our Northern Strategy programs, you heard a bit about that earlier uh, from Delma. Um, they are unique gender justice partnerships, as you learned, uh, and Delma and Anu spoke about. Um, with Makeway Foundation, we have been honored, simply honored, to support the launch of a Northern Women and Girls Advisory Committee with representatives from the Yukon, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Nunavik, and Anatsiavut. The, the committee uh, works to make sure that your support goes to great initiatives in the North. Um, so we know that uh, uh, you're keeping gender justice in the spotlight. Um, so what you've done is, been, is you've enabled us, the foundation and our partners to take the long view to understand trends, respond to evidence and push for best practices to end gender injustice. This important systemic uh, work does the following. It's about developing resetting nor uh, the resetting normal reports that we, uh, that we launched last year to give policymakers a roadmap for gendered recovery. Um, it's about research on shock proofing Canada to prevent crisis related spikes, um, caused by gender-based violence for now and into the future. The violence at home uh, signal for help, um, public education campaign to help people do their part to support survivors in a time of increased risk of gender-based violence. And we heard about that earlier. It's also about improving national decision-making for gender justice by enabling the foundation to sit at key policy tables, which is a major part of what I do and upholding excellence in journalism on gender justice issues um, in Canada through the Landsberg Award that we uh, co-partner and co-present with the Canadian Journalism Foundation. And all the times that you took the time to sign your names onto our online petition letters on concerns like sexual assault training for judges. So this is all great work and we are ever so thankful to you for your support. In fact, what we say is that your support has indeed been tireless. So where do we go from here? Tireless action to look forward to now and into the future and here are just a few. Continued grant making to grassroots partners to run uh, transformative programming in every province and territory. Thousands more women, uh, girls, and gender diverse people moving out of poverty, out of violence, and into confidence and leadership. Uh, refreshed strategic priorities is a major part of our focus uh, over the coming year. Uh, so it's about having the priorities and plans for the foundation to meet CADA's contemporary gender justice concerns. And a fourth is about a strengthened and growing community of donors, partners and supporters with more opportunities to take action because we know without you, we are not able to do all that we do. So uh, just uh, a look at where uh, your support goes. And I won't go through all these numbers. I'll only say that uh, over the past, uh, in 2019, 2020, we were able to invest over $18 million in communities. Over $18 million. In this past year, 
we've been able to invest over $27 million in communities. So that's our 2020, 2021 year. Uh, I can't believe I'm actually saying these numbers, but what I will leave you with is this, is this quote, until all of us have made it, none of us have made it. That particular quote is what we live by, it's our motto. So uh, it was a quote by one of our founding mothers. Um, and it is in fact, our favorite quote by Rosemary Brown. She said this years ago, but it rings true, it rings especially true uh, today as we move forward. So I invite you uh, to actually read the full impact report on our website, canadianwoman.org. Uh, as we close off this part, I would like to give a very special thank you to the foundation staff team. Uh, I've never worked with a better, more hardworking group of women. Um, these special women, staff, people, volunteers, board um, have worked hard over a challenging year, giving everything they had to support the foundation's grantees, donors, partners, and colleagues. Uh, this I call a dream team. I want to personally thank all of them from the very bottom of my heart. Um, their energy, their drive is really what is behind the work of the Canadian Women's Foundation. So now I'd like to bring Anuretta on, um, who's our VP of Community Initiatives, who will join me uh, in the Q&A part of our conversation this afternoon. Hi, Anu. Colette, hello everyone. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so we have a first question to start off with. Okay. And I thought I would actually um, see what your answer is. I, I think it's a, okay. it's a very is it, is it a test, Anu? Is it no, a test? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's one of our favorite questions, actually. So okay. if we could expand mm -hmm. and do more and fund more, uh, what issues would we want to address or where would we want to focus that if we could dream even bigger? Like you said, those numbers were amazing this year, but mm -hmm. even bigger. You know, I love that kind of question because it inspires me. Um, and as we're about to take on uh, the, the, the task of creating our new strategic priorities, uh, mm -hmm. it's a great question to ask. Um, you know, I can think of a number of things that we could do more of. But I think one of the most pressing thing, particularly because uh, we're, we're hopefully coming out of a pandemic and will be recovering, it's about strengthening the capacity of the gender equality sector. So the organizations that deliver the programs on the ground to build their capacity. Um, because what I'm, what I'm really looking forward to is them being able to serve more people in their mm -hmm. communities, to reach more, to be able to address what they see as emerging issues. Um, because that's not been an area we've been able to work a lot in. And we just sort of began that journey. So I'm looking forward to that. And really, at the end of the day, what I really want to see is systemic change, mm -hmm. right? I yeah. want to be able to see systemic change that has generational impact because we've been living with this for too long. We've gone through a pandemic that shows us how easy it is mm -hmm. to kind of rob us of the gains we've made. So we want the kind of systemic change that cements the gains that, that, that we want and that we need to have so that this won't happen in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't really have anything to add to that, Paula. Okay. <laughs> I, I love what you said about doing more of what we're already doing. And I think that's uh, because I think we do have a really strong base and that really does uh, um, reflect in the work that we're doing. Um, and you mentioned the, the, um, the ongoing, like a generational impact. So I know I'm going to jump into a question that we have here um, about how the foundation is bringing the voices of the next generation of feminists who are coming up, who are coming forward. What, what I, I, again, I've got, uh, there's things that we are doing and other things that we could be doing. So um, yeah, I'll let you start. I like this one too. <laughs> Because because we're doing something that we've we've needed to do for a long time, 
right? Mm-hmm. And I think we've only just begun. And it's the it's the creation of a of a youth advisory committee, right? Um, and and this can happen in many areas of our work, mm-hmm. but we've we we're going down this path because it's been a missing voice at the foundation, right? Young women, young people, gender diverse young people need to have a voice in the work we're doing. They need to keep us relevant, probably a little bit cooler, but relevant, right? In terms of this work, because um, if we're not actually addressing the issues that they're facing, I think about the news, (laughs) it's hard to think about it, but it's a reality Um, at at Western University just this past week. Like I can't even imagine the impact Mm -hmm. of such a horrible, horrible experience, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, when you haven't even begun your school year, you know, when you're so excited about being in university, you know? So so sexual violence and sexual Mm -hmm. assaults need to end. Violence against women, girls, gender diverse people need to end. And and it's it it can't be acceptable that we live in a society where this is the norm. Mm -hmm. You know, our founders that thought about the importance of creating this organization 30 years ago, this is exactly the kind of work that they wanted to be doing. And it's Mm -hmm. not okay that 30 years into the future, that this this is still occurring. So there's much more work to be doing. There's much more education. Uh, and it, it cuts across all areas, whether it's in, you know, education, public awareness, the law, um, you know, holding people accountable, you know, all of that needs to come together so that this is not continuously repetitive occurrence in, in young exactly. people's lives, in young women's lives. Exactly. And I, I would just add to that. Um, the work that we do with the teen healthy relationships programs where we talk to young people who are often at the high school age but Mm -hmm. mentoring into into the um the area of of post-secondary education like what happened at western those programs really give young people the opportunity to explore questions like consent questions about um sexual identity questions of um of their own um uh, boundaries and their ability to communicate those things Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as much wider questions about how they are in relationship with family with friends in community in school in work and even within Canada how we're in relationship with um, our First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities so that work for me it's it's all connected to understanding that the next generation of feminists have have really important concerns that will change the shape of what we think is, you know, the priority. And I think they've already started doing that. Mm-hmm. And that's what we have to listen for, right? So that we're responsive to, to what's Absolutely. Coming, Absolutely. coming up. Yeah. yeah. That's what yeah. keeps us relevant. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, and so we have a question about the kinds of programs we fund in Atlantic Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm again, I'm just going to reflect on the teen healthy relationships programs because we're just about to launch a building the field hub about bringing together groups in Atlantic Canada around um, the teen healthy relationships and, and uh, doing networking and convening. But maybe you can fill us in in some of the other kinds of programs we're, we're supporting in in that area of Canada. Or I can continue. I don't know if you have favorite programs. We mentioned the group in Shediac. Um, yeah. that, well, uh, I, I can mention a few, but I'm going to leave this one to you, Ellen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, um, some of the really important programs that we've um, supported in the, last, um, in the last few years have really, um, communi- have really brought together groups from rural areas of Atlantic Canada, as well as the obvious places like Halifax or Fredericton. Um, And I think that's an important thing that we need to understand. So groups like Antigonish Women's Mm Centre with their peer learning for teens or um, groups in Halifax, Fredericton and Sexual Assault Centre, which covers the whole of of, um, of, uh, New Brunswick, in fact. It's not just Fredericton. It's a a province-wide. It's the the only sexual assault centre 
in the whole of the um, of the province. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're doing really important work um, that and, and they are spread really you know, far and wide and they need support. Uh, those are a couple of the examples for me of, of, of organizations that are really doing critical work. Um, for many years, we funded a group called Women Unlimited. Um, also out of Nova Scotia, One of my and, they have just, <laughs> and they have just launched into a whole new um, adventure. Yes, uh, and it's very, very exciting to have funded something for so many years mm -hmm. and then see them take off into they're now part of the Nova Scotia social mm -hmm. service in, institutions right. um, and will be providing services for women within, um, you know, on a much wider scale but also those specialized services that they've gotten so good at developing for women's entrepreneurship and to support women, um, women in trades and technology. Yeah, and the only other one I'll add to that is why they will say Halifax, which is what, right. also one of my favorite yes. organizations that does incredible work um, in various areas of, of the province uh, in Nova Scotia. So um, wonderful organizations it looks like we've come to the end of our q a period actually i think so yes we're running a little bit late so we're yes. getting the <laughs> thanks and so, a great great uh, doing this session with you <laughs> well it is my pleasure for the first time uh uh in in her uh role in her new role as uh, chair of the Canadian Women's Foundation, I'd like to introduce our new board chair, uh, Lori Young, to share a few um, words about the Canadian Women's Foundation board. Hi, thank you. Everyone can hear me? Um, welcome, that's so inspiring. Thank you everybody for the short stories that you've already shared with us. I am honored today to join you as the board chair for the Canadian Women's Foundation humbled to support this group of directors in this role. These volunteers commit their time and their energy to the foundation's tireless leaders, ensuring that we stay true to our mandate and keep moving forward with our efforts toward gender justice. And I think you've seen today how much we've already accomplished. Today, we are bidding a fond farewell to our outgoing chair, board chair, Angela Johnson. Angela has committed seven years to this board on the whole, including two as chair. She's helped see us through many challenges to a place of strength today. I spoke to Angela just before this meeting and she was unable to make it, but in her absence, we thank her and wish her all the best in her future work. And I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the remarkable life of Sarah Robinson a member of our board who sadly passed away this year. Sarah was a member of the Fort Nelson and the Sauti First Nation in Treaty 8 territory. She was a proud stepmother and an auntie to, to many, a strong advocate for indigenous women and an educator. Sarah was only on our board for a short time and we wish that we'd had more time to get to know this very inspiring woman. Our deepest sympathies extend to her loved ones and to her communities. And on behalf of the entire foundation, thank you, Board of Directors, for the ways that you have risen to the challenge of building a gender equal Canada. On to the next year. I'm going to move on to my colleagues who are going to share a little bit about our Got Your Back campaign that's happening right now to support girls and young people during this time of uncertainty. We spoke to representatives from two of the 34 girls and youth serving programs that the foundation supports right now all over Canada. Here's a little video about that. Hi, I'm Natalie Lozano and I'm on the Community Initiatives team at the Canadian Women's Foundation. And I'm Sarah Ruddle. I'm on the public engagement team at the Canadian Women's Foundation. And over the last year and a half, many girls and gender diverse young people have felt really alone uh, in their struggles with mental health and healthy relationships, in their identity, in their sense of belonging, and in their confidence. Uh, and we know these challenges are made more difficult for some young people, like those living with a disability, those who are racialized, living in poverty or in remote communities, and those who are trans or non-binary, and that's just to name a few. So the Canadian Women's Foundation launched Got Your Back. It's a campaign to help parents and caregivers support girls and gender diverse young people as they head into another school year of uncertainty. 
uh, and to raise funds for 34 programs all over Canada that build belonging, community connection, mental health, healthy relationships, and confidence. And today we're happy to be joined by people from a few of the, incred the incredible programs that help teens learn about healthy relationships. Yes, I'd like to introduce Jimmy Roussa from Le Bureau de la Communauté Haitienne de Montréal and Sarah Wiley from Sexual Assault Centre Waterloo Region. The Teen Healthy Relationship Grant supports 15 programs that work with teens to prevent gender-based violence. We know that teen years are a critical time to teach healthy relationship skills, to reduce and to prevent gender-based violence in the long term. So now I'd like to turn it over to our grantees. Can you each tell us about one of the challenges being faced by the young people you work with? I will go ahead and say that one of the major challenge nowadays is about believing in a bright future. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic um, has increased sexual and gender-based violence. We know that folks are stuck at home with abusers, uh, that they are, we, we see rates of exploitation online increasing, um, and youth are facing this increased level of violence with fewer resources, fewer supports, and fewer connections to community. I'm hearing that right now they don't have that sense of security um it could be in terms of their own future um school wise work wise um and also safety wise um so they're really concerned about their own safety they're concerned about um families friends um so that basically brings up also the level of anxiety um so the future does not look so bright right now how have you shown or what's one way that you are showing program participants or young people that you've got their backs, particularly during these trying times? So the Sexual Assault Support Center of Waterloo Region adapted very quickly to the COVID-19 pandemic. We actually were serving clients through uh, group facilitation and online counseling the first week of lockdown last year. And our education programs, including our Empower and Allyship program, uh, have been similar. We've pivoted and we've been able to still uh, connect with 152 youth from across the province and have them engaged in our Empower and Allyship program. Uh, this includes the virtual Empower and Allyship camp that we hosted in July, uh, which was really, really remarkable. Um, and we had youth from uh, across the province come together uh, and create artwork, have discussions, um, and really get that comprehensive, healthy relationship and sex education that so many of them are lacking during this time because unfortunately it's not being prioritized when uh, folks are switching between in-person and online learning. Um, all of our programming is low barrier and free. So we've done things like dropping materials off to youth homes. We have made all of our programming really accessible. Um, we worked really closely with the uh, ACE program in the Waterloo Region District School Board for students with disabilities and provide accessible sexual health and healthy relationship education to those students. Um, to make sure that they had access to the, the education and care that they needed. This is a, a quote from a teacher in the ACE program um, whose class participated in our program. This content that is not always easily offered to students with these needs. It was well organized and presented in a way that made sense for the students. Instructors responded well to feedback and made the environment that allowed students to feel comfortable. We're really proud to create a space where youth can talk about the things that they're dealing with, talk about mental health, sexuality, dating, um, and things that because of the lack of connection and resources, they're not having spaces to talk about in a safe way. During the, at the start of the pandemic, uh, we kind of uh, lost connection with people uh, and there's been a huge shift towards virtual uh, connection or virtual spaces. Um, however, we tried as much 
as we could as soon as we knew that students were allowed back at school we made it a priority um, to be there in person uh, knowing that they they need to have that human they need to feel that human connection so therefore we were fortunate enough uh, to deliver our program in person uh, one of the things that we've added uh, to our programs is also to have a mindful meditation uh, at the beginning of each session. Um, so as we know, many were going through a lot of stress. Um, so we try to create that space where, you know, they could feel at ease, they could feel comfortable to share um, either their concerns, their worries, etc. So this is an extra component that we added, uh, which was a huge success, a huge success. Uh, they actually love it. They loved it. Um, we also made sure that we were there to support them emotionally. Uh, so therefore, uh, our facilitators, uh, including myself, made himself available uh, for after each session, um, for students that perhaps wanted to share privately um, some situations, um, some concerns, uh, some problems that they're going through, uh, knowing that it's not easy. Uh, and we're trying to also focus and emphasize on resiliency. It's really about teaching them about resiliency. So. These are the things that we added to show them we are there for you. We're here for you, regardless of the current situation, regardless of the current context, circumstances, we're not going to let you down. We're here. Thanks a lot, Jimmy and Sarah, for your reflections, for the learning, for sharing with us the learnings that you've had this past year particularly, but most importantly, for being there for the young people that you've been there for for many of whom you are the first point of contact. Um, I now wanted to take a minute to share with you all or highlight some of the other ways the Canadian Women's Foundation is working with young people. And so first is the Youth Advisory Consultation Team, which brought together nine young people from different communities across Canada to develop a youth engagement strategy and to solidify what a Youth Advisory Committee can look like at the Foundation. We're very excited about this initiative. And the second is the building the feel of teen healthy relationships, which is a national collective action, bringing together young people, community programs, academics, and policymakers and funders to share successes and challenges, as well as to discuss the future of teen healthy relationship programming. Um, and just to name some of the initiatives are, is the Quebec Hub, which is working with youth to address sexual violence in schools in Quebec, and the First Nations Métis and Inuit Hub, which is completely youth led and has been working on addressing healthy relationships in indigenous communities. And very soon in the fall, we'll be launching the Atlantic Hub. So we're very excited about all this work. You know, I'll put it out to people. What can you do? Um, we clearly have to let young people know we've got their backs and we have to make sure these programs are available. Um, so uh, visit canadianwomen.org to support the Got Your Back campaign and make sure you follow us on social media for more ways you can support girls and, and gender diverse young people. Um, and both of your organizations, you do you have social accounts that people can follow as well? Just throw out your, your handles before we go. Yeah, so the Sexual Assault Support Center of Waterloo is on all the social platforms. You can follow us, just SaskWR on uh, Twitter and Instagram, and then we're the Sexual Assault Support Center of Waterloo Region on Facebook. On our side, basically, we are mostly on Facebook, so they could uh, directly type BCHM. Uh, they could easily find our organization. Hello everyone. So um, it's my very big privilege to let you know about a special honor uh, that uh, we're celebrating alongside our president and CEO, Paulette Senior. Uh, this year, the University of Lethbridge presented her with an honorary doctor of laws <laughs> in recognition of her, and I have to underline this very, very firmly, 
her steadfast commitment to justice and equality, and her work to improve the lives of women, girls, and non-binary people affected by poverty, violence, and marginalization. We are thrilled and inspired, and here is a window into the ceremony for honorary degree recipients. It is my honor to introduce Paulette Senior. Paulette Senior is a respected and outspoken leader who has been a strong advocate for women, girls, and gender diverse folks throughout her career. As an immigrant to Canada at the age of 11, she experienced the barriers many racialized girls face, and that sparked a passion for justice and equality. She has worked tirelessly to build an inclusive society free of violence and poverty. First, on the front lines with social service organizations, and later at the helm of national organizations, including being the CEO of the YWCA, and in 2016, the president and CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation where she continues her efforts to create a more just and equal society. For her steadfast commitments to justice and equality and her work to improve the lives of women, girls and non-binary people affected by poverty, violence and marginalization, the University of Lethbridge is proud to present Paulette Senior with the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. I'd like to invite Paulette Senior to address the graduands. Eminent Chancellor, President Mann, Board Chair Schlachter, honored guests, family, friends, and most importantly, our graduates. I'm so grateful and happy to be here with all of you. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for this incredible recognition and honor, and I am still surprised. And congratulations to everyone who has reached this important pinnacle despite the challenges of the pandemic. In her book, Letter to My Daughter, Maya Angelou wrote, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. After living with the pandemic for more than a year, I'm sure there are moments when all of us have felt reduced. We struggled with the restrictions, a heightened sense of uncertainty and looming questions about what the future will look like. When will the pandemic be over? What about the economy? Will I get a job? Will things ever go back to normal? No one has all the answers. And the fact is, uncertainty has always been part of our lives. But if we can look past the discomfort the pandemic stirs within us, we can glimpse the possibility of something better ahead and actually start working toward it. In other words, we can choose not to be reduced. What if we choose to make this opportunity to really think about the kind of normal we want? And how can we all take part in making this happen? Not just for ourselves, but for everyone. Now, I don't want to diminish the devastating impact of this pandemic, but the pause it has brought us in some ways is an incredible gift. That interruption to our normal lives and routines is giving us a chance to really see the fault lines and inequities in the status quo. Being away from our loved ones has taught us how much we need each other, how valuable caregiving really is, and how we must take care of each other as a society. So as we look toward the pandemic recovery, my work and that of the Canadian Women's Foundation is propelled by the words of the late but great Rosemary Brown, one of our founding mothers. Rosemary, who was also 
the first black woman elected to a provincial legislature in Canada once said, until all of us have made it, none of us have made it. She was talking about looking beyond our own successes, being inclusive, using our privileges and platforms to remove barriers for the most vulnerable and marginalized. And if we can all embrace that spirit, we'll move closer to creating the kind of systems and society that doesn't leave people behind. And in some ways, that's starting to happen. After decades of working in social change organizations, I am happy, if not relieved, to, be, to really see fresh momentum and action on many key issues. Long-term care, child care, livable wages, and paid sick days, just to name a few. There is a new groundswell for change to address deep-seated issues like anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. And we're seeing the emergence of leaders who prioritize people, well-being, and compassion. Now, I realize that many of you won't be pursuing careers in social justice, and I simply don't know why, but there are still many ways to use your voices, raise questions, challenge the status quo, and help to remove barriers. This can happen in families, communities, schools, workplaces, and even in your own social networks. There are many ways to bring everyone to the table and advocate for inclusion so that we can create a Canada that is just, equitable, and where all of us can indeed make it. Thank you again, and I wish you all the best in your endeavors. Wasn't that lovely? We are so proud of Paulette for being a recipient of this honor. It is well-deserved. I did tell her that any honor she gets, we all share. That's the kind of family that we are. So I hope that you feel really happy about seeing that and this recognition of a very tireless leader that we have. She's a colleague, she's an ally, she's a co-conspirator in the effort for gender justice. I wanna thank you for your patience and for sticking it out with us. I have just a few more things I would like to share. I'm going to share my screen so you can see this. Of course, I'll leave you with the Got Your Back campaign. As we spoke about today, this is an active campaign to make sure that girls and gender diverse youth get all the support they need at what has been a very challenging time for them and a time of many unknowns. Please, if you are able to give and support, go to canadianwomen.org. The URL is right there. And you can also find resources, tips for parents and caregivers to be able to address these issues in your own life, to be able to support young people who look up to you. Please give today if you can. And of course, please access those tips if you need them. I'd also like to remind you of a couple of things. Coming up on October the 7th, we'll do an update about the Got Your Back campaign and get deeper into these 34 programs for girls and young people on teen healthy relationships and girls empowerment. We'll also be speaking with some special guests. Stay tuned for more information about that. That's going to be on October the 7th. And Canada's federal voting day is coming up this Monday, September the 20th. Please remember to consider all your options and vote for gender justice. Build that up because we are in a reality where 30 years of gender equality gains have been shaken in the pandemic. This is a problem and it doesn't matter who is elected. We have to do something about it and we have a role to play first by voting and then by putting the positive pressure on for change. And if you didn't win a prize, you still do have a chance to win one of two $100 gift cards from Reitman's. So just fill out our brief survey form at the end. We'd like to know what you think we, uh, how we think we did and what you would like to learn more about the next time that we come together. It will come up on screen if everything goes right, if the tech works with us, it'll come up on screen when we're finished tonight. And you can also get a link to that tomorrow when an email is sent out after this event. And of course, I would like to encourage you, please keep in touch with us. There's lots of way that you can follow, share, listen, and of course, our website, if you go to that, you can sign up for our e-newsletter. 
And we just want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to keep talking with us, keep conversing with one another, and get in touch for more events that we're doing and more campaigns in the future. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great rest of the night. We appreciate you and thank you for being tireless. Have a great night.